Good morning, everyone. Hello. Hope you're all well this morning. Um, let me just check. Can you see my presentation? OK, um, fantastic. Um, so as uh, James said, I'm Rachel. I work as an education officer for a charity called Marine Conservation Society, and you can see our logo in the bottom of the screen there. So the word marine um, uh, is uh, meaning anything to do with the ocean. Uh, and the word conservation is about protecting animals and protecting plants. And then the word society basically means a group of people. So if you put all of those things together, the Marine Conservation Society. Oh, sorry, I've got a cough. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting too excited. <coughs> the Marine Conservation Society is a group of people working together to protect plants and animals in the ocean. So today, as James said, we're going to um, look at the Adventures of Scout book. So I'm hoping that either you attended uh, the talk by the three engineers where they read the book or that you've had a chance to read the book in school. Um, and we're going to chat about some of the creatures that Scout meets on her journey along the beach. And we're also going to talk about how you can help with beach cleans or litter picks where you are, just like Scout does in the book. Let's get started. So does anyone know the name of this creature that appears in the book? If you think you know the name of this creature, you can pop it in the chat for us. See if we've got anyone who's feeling bright this morning, who's got their brain switched on already. If you know the name of the first creature that Scout meets on the in the book. And in the book, it describes this creature as a pot that scuttled past with an extremely large claw. So we've got lots of different types of crab in the UK, but this type of crab is a hermit crab. So well done if you got that correct. Most crabs have a really hard skin on the outside and this protects their body um, from bashing against the rocks in waves and it also protects them from being eaten because it's too hard for a lot of animals to be able to break that skin. But the hermit crab, it's got a squishy body. So it means that it needs to find something to help protect its body. So a bit like if you ride a bike and you wear a helmet to protect your head, the crab needs to wear something on its back to protect it. So the hermit crab in the book is using this horrible, smelly, plastic yogurt pot but Scout helps it to find a nice natural shell instead. So this is a photo of what a real life hermit crab looks like and you can see sticking out from the shell you can see the large legs and the large claws of the hermit crab and they use their claws to bite with each other to protect the space that's theirs because they're quite territorial of their space. They also use their claws to catch food and to cut that food apart. So they've got a really sharp claw that they can slice the food. And then they've got a claw that's got big lumps on where they can crush the food apart. And they also use their claws to talk to each other. So by doing this, it makes sound or bashing it against rocks. It also makes sound and vibrations. And so they can kind of communicate with each other. So next up, as Scout walks along the beach, she comes across a whale in a spot of trouble. And in the book, it says Scout parted some rubbish, revealing a whale with a kazoo trapped in its blowhole and waving its tail. Now, whales live in the sea, but they can't actually breathe under the water like fish can. So they need to come to the surface every now and then to breathe. And they breathe through their blowhole, which is essentially a bit like their nose. So just like humans, whales breathe through their noses. Um, and but their mouths are underneath the water, so they can't breathe through their mouth because otherwise they'll just suck up a load of water. So they breathe through their blowhole and their blowhole is on the top of their head. Some whales like sperm whales can hold their breath under the water for up to two hours, which is 
crazy. Two hours. I can hold my breath for about two seconds. Never mind two hours. Um, and when they then come to the surface, they let out a big spray of air from their blowhole. And you can see in the picture here, this big spray of a kind of water and air, which is them kind of breathing out their last bit before they can breathe in the air from the surface of the water. So this poor whale in the book has got a kazoo, which is like a little musical instrument stuck in its blowhole. So until Scout came along and removed that kazoo from its blowhole, it couldn't breathe properly. So we're really lucky in the UK because we do have whales living in the waters. And if you've ever been uh, to Scotland on holiday, maybe if anyone's lucky enough, um, then we have orca there, which are also known as killer whales. And they're particularly found on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and we also have humpback whales, which occasionally visit the UK and they're stopping off and eating food on their journey further up north. Um, and very occasionally we also have sperm whales. So we're, we're really lucky that we get these visitors here in the UK. So this creature here, this poor turtle in the book says, I'm trapped in this shirt, it's stuck over my head. Now, do you think that we have turtles in the UK? So we said we've had whales, but what about turtles? Do you think we get them in the UK? Pop yes or no for me in the chat if you think that we have turtles living here in the UK or do you think that they only live in warm tropical waters? So unfortunately the turtle in this book is trapped in some litter and that is a problem for a lot of sea creatures. Things like turtles, sharks, fish, dolphins. Um, so we've got so far in the book them using litter as a shell, we've got one stuck in a blowhole, and then here the turtle is trapped in some litter. So let's see what you guys said. Yes, we do have turtles in the UK. So we get the leatherback turtle, it's a big, big, huge turtle, and that visits the UK in summer when our seas are warmer and when we have quite a lot of jellyfish in the sea because turtles love to eat jellyfish. So they come to the UK and feed on the jellyfish that are here. Um, and we're so, so lucky that we have turtles in our waters. So we need to make sure that we can protect them and make sure that litter isn't harming them like this poor turtle in the book. So this is a photo of the leatherbacks that visit the UK. And as you can see, it's a massive turtle and it's got these big ridges that run down the side of it. And it travels massive dis distances from the Caribbean all the way to the UK to feed on jellyfish. The turtle in this picture here has something in its mouth. Can you tell what that is? So this turtle thought it was a nice juicy jellyfish bobbing in the surface of the water and so it went to go and eat it but actually that clear object bobbing about was a plastic carry bag and if turtles and other sea creatures eat plastic it goes down into their stomach and it doesn't break down like normal food does so it just stays in their stomach and it takes up space in their stomach that should be for nice tasty food. So it's really important again that we make sure that we have way more tasty food and jellyfish in the ocean than we do have plastic in the ocean. The last animal that Scout meets on her journey is a gull and gulls are what we call scavengers so that means that they will eat any food, they scavenge food. So they might hunt for things like crabs and fish, or they might just take anything that they can find lying around on the floor. Um, so if you've ever been to the seaside before, you might know that these birds love to eat any leftover bread that's on the floor, or they might even come and steal one of your chips. Or my dad, he was eating an ice cream once, and a gull came straight away and took the ice cream out of its hand. 
So they're not fussy eaters and they will take anything uh, that's around. Now we've got lots of different types of gull. So this photo here shows what we call a herring gull, which is one of our most common types of gulls. So you get lots of herring gulls. This beautiful gull here is what we call a black headed gull. Now it only actually has its black head in the summer and then in the winter it loses those black feathers and it has a, a white head and it's much smaller than a herring gull. And now this is a gorgeous little kitty wake and they are seagulls so they spend their uh, whole winter at the sea fishing in the sea. And then you've got this one here which is a black backed gull and this is much much larger than the other gulls so this one's really easy to identify because it's a big one with that really really dark black back on it. Now some gulls live in land so you might have seen them in areas where you live and some live by the sea so you might have seen them on holiday but there isn't really such a thing as a seagull so they're just all different types of gulls, having gull, black headed gull, some of them live by the sea, some of them live inland. So on Scout's journey, she has met a crab with a yogurt pot and a whale with a kazoo, a turtle with a carry bag and a gull with lots of rubbish. But where does all the rubbish come from? When the whale asked Scout, what brings you here? Scout replied, to help clean up this rubbish, is the source near? So Scout is trying to find out where all this rubbish comes from. And the whale said, well, it floats in with the tide. So some litter, things like fishing line, which might get accidentally lost at fishing boats, that might float in with the sea and with the waves, and that might get washed up onto the beaches. The whale also said, it's one of my gripes. If you look down the beach, it comes out of two pipes. Can you spot the pipes in this picture here? So can you spot two pipes in that picture where litter and rubbish is coming out from? So what pipes do is that they carry water from land to the sea. And this water comes from lots of different places around land. And along with the water, sometimes it also carries litter as well. So how does this happen? Well, if litter is dropped in the street, it can fall into a drain. Um, so something like this, you might have seen these uh, on the street and these uh, basically normally would take rainwater off the street, but it can also take litter off the street as well. And this goes then through pipes and eventually ends up at the sea. Another source of water is from rivers. So here you've got the River Thames in London and rivers all around the country. Litter can get blown into those rivers um, or it could get accidentally dropped into those rivers and all rivers eventually lead to the sea. And another source of water is from our bathrooms. So water from our sinks and from our toilets goes to a big sewage treatment places where the water is cleaned and then it will enter the sea via pipes. But if there's litter in there, sometimes that doesn't get cleaned out in the water treatment. So if you put things like wet wipes down the toilet, which should not go down the toilet, they should go into a bin. But if they were to go down the toilet, they could enter the pipes and then end up in the sea. So any litter dropped on the floor or blown out of bins or flushed down the toilet could end up on our beaches through these pipes. So do you recognise any of these litter items in this photo here? So on the left hand side, we've got Scout um, in the book cleaning up the rubbish. And on the right hand side, we've got a photo from one of the beaches that we visited in the UK where we did a litter pick. Do you recognise anything that you can see 
Can you see any particular items here? So we've got here a plastic bottle. Here we've got some fishing line. We've got a face mask here. And then there's lots of little bits and bobs here. We've got possible wet wipes. Um, there's some sweet wrappers. Um, so all different types of stuff here. And a lot of the stuff in this photo is made out of plastic. And plastic is a man-made material. So that means it isn't natural. Uh, and because it's man-made, it's very, very strong and it lasts a very, very long time in the environment. And once litter enters the ocean, it's really hard to get it out. Um, and it's harder to find it as well because the ocean is so huge and it's so very, very deep as well. So once that litter is in there, it's hard to get out and it can cause a lot of damage to sea creatures. So what can we do to help stop so much litter ending up on the beaches? So Scout in the book says, I'll tell people in town to stop dropping litter, which gets to the sea through these pipes from the river. So telling other people about the problem is really, really important. Uh, and it helps people um, know that there is an issue and it gets people to think about what they can do to help. So make sure when you go home today that you chat to your family and you talk to your friends at school as well who might not be listening to this talk and tell them about what you've learned today about the sea creatures that live in our amazing ocean, about litter and how it's harming those creatures. But most importantly, tell them how they can help as well. So Scout says, I'll ask my new friends to help me clean up. And then after the clean, the beach was now safe and teamwork was fun. So beach cleaning is a really great thing to do. And as Scout says, it's also a really fun thing to do as well with your friends or as a school. Um, so you can help. You don't need to go to a beach to do this because as we said, litter can come from anywhere in the country and end up in the sea. So you can litter pick no matter where you are. It could be in your school grounds. It could be in your local park. It could be near a river or if you're lucky enough, it could be on a beach as well. Um, so what we do at the Marine Conservation Society, the charity that I work for, is we do lots and lots of beach greens all across the UK. So as well as picking up the litter, something else that we do, which is really, really important, is to write down the different types of litter that we found. So you can see the girls here holding a survey form. So as we walk along the beach, we collect something and then we write down, is it a plastic bag, for example, or is it a plastic bottle? Is it a, a metal drinks can? Is it a sweet wrapper? Is it a wet wipe? And we record all this information down to help us find out what is the most common items that are littering our beaches. And then we produce some results like this. So you can see here our top 10 litter items that are found on beaches. So there's a lot of litter items here that are made out of plastic. And the number one item is plastic pieces. So plastic that's been broke up into fragments. And we find lots and lots of this on beaches. And the second most common item you can see here is cigarette butts. So not many people know that, that, that these actually have plastic in them. So people think that they're made out of paper um, and therefore maybe that's why people litter them because they think maybe the paper will break down, even though you should never litter anything at all. But from our survey results, we can see that cigarette butts are a big problem. So then we need to think, OK, how can we stop people from littering these? So maybe we need to educate more people. We need to tell more people about the problem. We need to tell people that they've got plastics in them and that they've got chemicals in them and that they should not be dropped in the environment. But also we can make it easier for people by making sure that we have bins. 
So on our beaches, making sure there's lots of bins so that people can easily put these into a bin and therefore they don't litter. So by finding out what the most So as I said, you don't need to be uh, by the sea. And there's some examples here of people litter picking in their local area as well. So as well as telling people about the problem and as well as doing litter picks to help clean the environment, you can also do something um, where you try and reduce the amount of plastic that you use. So it is now July and every July we have our plastic challenge. So this is a challenge for you to try and use less plastic. So think about a plastic item that you use maybe every day, maybe you use it a few times a week that might end up in the bin. Could you stop using this item or instead of using a plastic version, could you use a different material instead? So for example, some of you might drink from a plastic water bottle um, at lunchtime or if you're on a picnic, uh, but this will end up in the bin and it might end up in the sea. So instead of a re, you could use this reusable bottle. So in this photo here, you've got that green reusable bottle that's made out of metal and you can use this time and time again you just fill it up with water and you wash it at the end of the day and then you can keep using it. So it's a really, really simple swap that you could do to stop using that plastic bottle and start using a reusable bottle instead. Or you might use a plastic carry bag to carry things in or you might use um, plastic uh, cling film to have your sandwiches in on a picnic. Instead, you could use a rucksack or a lunch box. So really, really simple swap that you can do. It doesn't need to be really tricky. It doesn't need to be hard. Have a think about plastic that you use and whether you could swap that and use another material that can be used time and time again instead of something ending up in the bin. So I want you to go away from today and have a think and challenge yourself. Is there something that I use that's plastic that ends up in the bin? Could I stop doing that? Um, one other example is if you go to the shop and buy sweets. So a lot of sweets are wrapped in plastic. But if you're lucky enough to have one of those old school sh sweet shops near you where you've got all the sweets in the big glass jars, um, which are really great, then you don't have to say, I'm going to give up sweets. But what you could say instead is I'm not going to buy the sweets from the shop that are covered in plastic. Instead, I'm going to take my own box with me to one of those sweet shops and I'm going to get them to fill that out of those big glass jars. And then you're not using that plastic item um, and you can probably fit more sweets into a box that you take with you as well. So that's a good little trick. It's a win win situation. More sweets, less plastic. Happy days. So with your help, by helping reduce the amount of plastic that you use, by helping telling people about the problem and by helping by doing uh, litter picks or beach cleans, we can go from looking at a beach that looks like this, where it's full of rubbish um, and it's not safe to looking at a beach like this, that's nice and clean and safe for people and for the animals as well. So I want to say thank you so much for listening today. Um, it's been great to talk to you about Scout and her beach cleaning adventures. It's a really fantastic book and I hope you've enjoyed reading it. Uh, and I hope you recommend it to other people to read as well, because it's a really great book. And hopefully it's inspired you to have your own adventures outside. So whether that's a, a beach or a local park or the woods, just like Scout, 
you can go and meet animals out in the wild and also you can go and help to save our environment as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my presentation now and then I'm around if you guys have got any questions. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm sure there are many things that young people can do, but we need to act quickly. We need to tell everyone to stop littering and take action now. Um, we've had some absolutely fantastic questions come in. Um, so we will start off with, um, this is class nine lawn primary school in Swindon. And Darcy would like to know, would any sea creatures become extinct if we kept on littering? That is quite possible, yeah. So there's there's many reasons that sea creatures are becoming extinct. So it's not just litter that's a problem. There's things like climate change, which is affecting creatures, or overfishing, which is affecting creatures, or chemical pollution, which is damaging habitats. So it's a kind of lots of little things together can affect uh, these creatures. But we are seeing some numbers starting um, to uh, decrease in number. Um, and so particularly things like um, birds that fish at sea. Um, so you might have seen on the TV before um, birds like gannets or things like albatross um, who fish at sea and they dive down into the water to catch a mouthful of fish, but they can often end up catching plastic and that plastic will stay in its stomach. There'll be no room for fish if it gets too much plastic, which means it can eventually die. And we're seeing thousands of seabirds that have got plastic in their stomach. So we are seeing numbers of seabirds particularly starting to reduce. Um, but as we said, it's not too late to help kind of turn that problem around. And there's lots of really fantastic research happening. There's lots of great people who are putting a lot of energy into monitoring these seabirds and seeing what they've got inside them. There's a lot of people who are putting a lot of energy into recovering plastic that's in the ocean and also stopping it from going in. So at the moment, we are seeing that there are some problems, but we can act and we can turn this story around and make it more positive. Thank you very much. Um, Ashman has a question for you. Is Do you know how much of our ocean is covered by rubbish? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know uh, a stat off the top of my head in terms of how much it is. Um, we have around 12 million tonnes of rubbish, they think, enters the sea each year. So a, a tonne is about the weight of a small car. So if you can imagine a small car full of rubbish and then imagine 12 million of them. I mean, I can't imagine that because it's a big number, but we think that there's about that much rubbish that enters the sea each year. So I don't know in terms of how much that spreads, but that is a lot of rubbish. And the other big problem is that because the ocean is connected around the world, so we're all connected by the ocean and uh, there's currents moving all the time in the ocean. So we can drop litter here in the UK and it can be found over in America even. Um, and there's islands in the world where there's never been any litter. There's no one even living on that island and they are getting litter as well because of the currents. So it is a widespread problem all around the world. We've even found litter at the deepest part of the ocean, the, um, the Mariana Trench, which is really, really deep. Um, and we found litter at the bottom there as well. So it is definitely a widespread problem um, in terms of uh, yeah, which area has the most. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but yeah, that's why it's really important to kind of stop it at the source from getting into the sea, because once it's in the sea, it's so vast. Um, no, thank you. It, it, it's very scary, very troubling. And as you say, to find it in the the deepest part of any ocean, it, it just is continuous and we must stop. Um, I don't know if I can pronounce this name of the school, but Wivelscombe Primary School um, is asking, are there any sea animals that are nearly extinct because of littering? 
Um, again, I think the, the things that are the most common are things like seabirds um, that I mentioned. Um, there's also been studies on turtles and in the study that uh, they looked at all of the turtles that they found in the study. So 100% of the turtles that they looked at in the study had plastic in their stomach. Um, so it doesn't always mean that that animal is going to die because of a result of that. Um, so there's lots of other reasons why that animal might die. Um, but if the problem with that plastic is that it doesn't it doesn't break up like food, so it will stay in that stomach. Um, so it's hard to know at the moment with things like turtles, whether deaths are caused by plastic or whether there might be other reasons um, that they're caused. Um, so I think that the, the, the kind of the worrying animals that are affected the most are, are seabirds and turtles. Thank you very much. Um, Amy at St Mary's Primary in Wiltshire uh, is asking, what is the most efficient way of getting rid of rubbish from our oceans? Oh, that's a great question. So there's been there's been lots of different uh, experiments of trying to get rid of rubbish. So you might have heard of the ocean cleanup, which is a really great idea. Um, and basically it kind of like sucks like a, a hoover uh, rubbish off the top of the ocean in an area where there is a lot of rubbish. Now this is a really great way of uh, getting rid of some of the rubbish that's there. The problem with the ocean cleanup is that there's also animals living in the ocean so it has also as well as catching litter it's also caught animals. So the best thing to do rather than think about how do we get litter out of the ocean is to think about how do we stop litter getting into the ocean so that is the that's the question that we need to ask and that's the thing that we need to focus on once it's in the ocean it's hard to remove but what we need to focus on rather than cleaning it up uh, we need to think about how do we stop it in the first place so like i said with the plastic challenge trying just to reduce the amount of litter that we create is a really, really great way of stopping it getting into the ocean. Um, so things like, yeah, the swaps that I said that you could make where you're instead of using a plastic bottle, you're using a reuser bottle. Or it could simply be things like if on a Friday you like having a treat of a Coca-Cola, for example, instead of getting that in a plastic bottle, get that in a can. So it doesn't mean that you have to stop it altogether. But plastic can only be recycled up to five times and then uh, the material, it's not strong enough to carry on being recycled. Um, so that might mean it ends up as litter and it could end up in the ocean, where something like a can can be recycled again and again and again and again. So it's a really good material. So we can make, as humans, we have done bad things to the ocean by causing litter, but as humans, we can also do really positive, really great things. So just in the way that we live our lives, if we think about using less things, using less resources, making sure that we recycle properly, making sure that we use reusable things properly and not littering and making sure that everyone is aware of the problem, all of those things together, that is the best way to tackle the problem um, because that's going to make the most difference. That I think answers another question that we have in, uh, from uh, 3B St Peter's Primary. Um, they're saying what can what can they do as a class because they they're sited in a rural village school. So any ideas for them? Yes, yeah, definitely. So it doesn't again kind of matter where you are in the UK because, as I said, the the litter from anywhere is a problem. And you might think, oh, there's nothing in our village. And often when I take people litter picking, whether that's into a local park or on a beach, they look around and they go, oh, there's no litter here. It's not a problem. But then when you actually start and you look closely, then you can see actually there is quite a lot of litter because it gets blown in from all sorts of places. Um, so it might get blown in from people dropping it. Sometimes there's litter that comes off farms, um, so it can get blown in from a lot of places. So there's always places that we can go out and, and pick litter. Um, 
but then in terms of like what you can do as individuals or as a school so a really great thing that all schools can do um, is to try and introduce a plastic free day um, so this could start off once a month and uh, then it could move to once a week where you try and use no plastic at all that day. Um, so you could start off by just thinking about lunches and introduce a plastic free lunch. Um, so make sure that if you have a canteen, that the, the people who are cooking the food are on board with this and providing a plastic free lunch. Or if you bring your lunches in, you can get your families involved. And I know schools who've started this with one plastic free lunch and then it went to once a week. And now every day they've realised actually it's really quite easy to make a plastic free lunch. Like it's really easy to make a, a picnic a, that you, and a pack lunch that you can take with you to school that has no plastic in. You can make a sandwich and put it into a lunch box. You can have fruit. You can chop up vegetables and put them into a lunch box. You can make crisps at home in the microwave or in the oven. You don't even need to buy them in the packet. It's really fun to make them at home. That doesn't come with plastic. You can take a reusable bottle. So a plastic free lunch, it might sound simple, but when you do something like that, that small change makes a big difference. And if you think if every school in the UK did a plastic free lunch once a week, the amount of rubbish that that would save would be amazing. So that's, I think, something that all schools can get involved in is a plastic free lunch. And then if it inspires you, you might want to do it more often or you might want to use a whole day where you use no plastic. No, that's true. And hopefully, you know, the people like it, the, the people behind the supermarkets will notice this, that people are not buying their packets of crisps and then maybe they will do something as well. But we say we all have to work together to do this. Um, here's a really nice question from Victoria Primary Academy 4B. They're asking you, Rachel, what is your favourite part of being part of the Marine Conservation Society? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I So within my job as an education officer, what I do is I do spend a lot of time behind a computer and I make education resources that you can use in school. So I make lots of lesson plans for teachers to use and that you can go onto our website and find. And then I make um, education resources that you could use if you have a brownies group or a scouts group. And so I have a lot of time on my laptop making things, designing things, making them look pretty. And that's fun. But my favourite job, uh, my favourite part of the job is always speaking to groups like yourself. So I feel really lucky when I get the chance to, to chat to groups like you and I get to hear your great questions. I get to hear what you're up to. And then doubly, it's amazing if I actually get to go into a school or onto a beach and meet people in person as well, um, because as uh as schools you always inspire me you always have really great questions you're also always doing something that's really inspiring in school um so i get to feel your energy and hopefully also you get to be inspired about the ocean as well so i really enjoy that part of the job yeah that's lovely to know you're very very enthusiastic and um they say the younger we can reach out to young people the better so hopefully they can go home spread the word tell their parents and hopefully help save, you know, more littering. Um, we'll just take a few more questions because we realise obviously everyone needs to get on to lessons as much as we'd love to stay here all day. Um, does the rubbish we put in the bin still end up in the ocean? Great question. So it, it can depend. Um, so not obviously not all of it does. Um, so the rubbish that we put in the bin, what happens to that? It goes on the rubbish trucks and it will go to landfill. So landfill is essentially a big hole in the ground where we put the rubbish in. Um, um, these can be open um, and that means that when it's a really windy day, some of that rubbish could go out. So it, the best thing to do is make sure that rubbish always goes into a, a bin bag when you put it into the bin and not loose because if you put rubbish loose into the bin then that means it's more it's more easy to blow away whereas if it's in a nice tight bin bag it hopefully won't blow away 
So in theory, the most of it should stay in landfill, but a lot of the time, um, if we put it loose in the bin or maybe something like a gull that we mentioned, those birds are scavengers, they might peck at rubbish bins um, and they can open up those bags and then that litter can blow away. So there is a chance that yes, that litter can end up in the environment. So again, the thing to do is just make less litter, just buy less and use less to make less litter. So say no to things if you don't really need them, you know, um, that is the best way to do it. Yeah, good words there. And we'll take this uh, question, which is from Jai uh, from Class 9 Lawn Primary School in Swindon. What was the worst speech you've had to clean? Was there a particular one? Oh, that's really interesting question. Um, we. Oh, hmm. The some beaches you go on and you think there's no litter here and then you start looking and there's there's a lot of litter and some beaches you go on and straight away you can see it and you you collect a lot. Um, so I I once uh, used to go to a beach up in um, up in Cumbria in the in the northwest and we cleaned it repeatedly over weeks and weeks and weeks and it was starting to look really nice. But then there was a massive storm and big, big waves. And basically that brought with it a lot of new litter. And that really showed us how much is out there. So that was really sad, but we carried on and we carried on cleaning and you've just got to carry on. Um, and But that was a really great project because we got a lot of people involved in it and a lot of people seeing stuff that they'd never seen before. And then there's a, there's a beach near me here. In, I live in Plymouth and there's a beach um, called uh, uh, at Rainhead and when you go there it's gorgeous, gorgeous white sand and you can't see any big litter but what they have there is lots of tiny litter, um, what we call microplastics and what happened was there was a ship that was uh, going past a few years ago now and it spilled a container that was full of these tiny little plastics so when you start digging in the sand and you start putting the sand through a sieve and shaking it then you can see these tiny little plastics but there's a really incredible volunteer project there and the guys are doing fantastic work at cleaning up the beach so even when you do go to a beach and you see litter often then that can be sad initially but then i just get really inspired actually by the amount of people who care and the amount of people who are doing really great things to clean up the beaches and to stop the litter at source as well. So I think with all of this, you don't, you know, you shouldn't focus on the negative. You should really focus on the positive and think about, right, yes, maybe there is a bit of a problem, but what can we do about it? We are going to help. And that's the thing that keeps you inspired and keeps you wanting to make a change. Um, so yeah, go away today thinking about those positive things that you can do to help. Certainly good advice there. Um, so we've got, there's so many questions and we're sorry to everybody that we can't get through all of these questions. Um, but as we've mentioned, if you want to send us uh, an email to ask an ambassador at canterbury.ac.uk, uh, we can send some of those questions on to Rachel. Is that okay, Rachel? Absolutely, and yep. And we've got some nice comments in here is um, Turtles class. Uh, they um, wanted to let us know that they are near a beach and each class always does a beach clean. So that's really nice to hear. And we just hope that um, children will go home today and tell their parents about this talk and, and hopefully they can ask their parents to help support this and um, if we can all just do one thing as Rachel said it will make a difference so thank you very much everyone lovely to see you all on here there have been lots of schools and um, we wish you a great day take care bye thanks bye